Yuli, you ready for this? Yeah. We are bringing on the man, the myth, the legend oh, himself. Sweet. Crazy John Brooks joins Tour Life now. Thank you so much for joining. How's it going? That's why I need makeup. Get no, no, makeup. you're, you're good. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, okay, so I got an email uh, from you saying that you wanted to come on the show and talk and I'm always down to have people come on that has stories or opinions or whatever. Um, at the time that you sent the email, I don't have the greatest, like one thing that is super lacking in disc golf is just the history of it, right? Like there's not, it's not told all that often or when you're watching coverage or anything like that, like that's how I kind of learn a lot of my stuff in other sports. I'm not really going back into the history bo books and looking, it's more of what I consume now and is talked about now. And so I was unfamiliar with who you were, but you sent a link and I'm wondering Silas, can you play this link real quick? Just a few seconds of it, just so everyone can kind of get a gist. This is the 2015 world championships, I believe. And let's see, can we get audio on this too, Silas? He's stepping in. Wanting to wipe that slate clean from one. There's that form we've come to see so much of this season. Big ols in the corner. Yeah, you're in there, Yuli. Reminded to stay still, those of you helping us in the audience. We'll have this left for par. Oh, and it just glances left. Just having some trouble focusing. We saw that. Big Eels. Today with Big Eels. Tap in. <laughs> so All right. I think, I think that's good right now. Wait, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. One second. You, oh, you want to? Oh, yeah. He misses this, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one go. That's tough. Yeah, that is tough. He still beat me in the, in the um, tournament. One go. Okay. It I the wanted tournament. people just to hear a little bit of that because... When I watched that, I was like, this is what I've been saying disc golf needs for so long. I thought that was incredible. One, I, I, I just want to kind of give you some compliments right here, if that's okay with you. One, you, ha you, have a, you have a great voice, which I think is huge. Thank right? you, I, I don't know how this podcast works. I don't have a great voice. So I don't know how people can listen to me this long. You actually have a fantastic voice. People are wondering why you're whispering. He was literally 15 feet away from the action folks. He's, he's doing the same thing that they do in golf where they're literally right there on the action, best angle, best view. Now, did you guys have any production back? Like, do you, did they have anything like they have now where they have people in the booth somewhere else? So, uh, thanks, thanks Brody for bringing this up. This was some real fun times, you know, the early days of disc golf planet TV under Dr. John Dusler. Um, and, and you're right. That was the old golf talk. You know, I've got my fact books and my cheat sheets covering up my microphone and, and my voice. So I don't distract the players. And that's actually done a lot on PGA broadcast, as yeah. you probably know. You know, our our production package was pretty lightweight just because the budget wasn't there. So everything is connected to what the what the funding is all about. As you know, it takes a village nowadays. So Disc Golf Pro Tour and Disc Golf Network are operating with a huge surplus and bank of support. Whereas in the, in these days with with Dr. John and with Disc Golf Pro uh, Disc Golf Planet. Uh, we did the best with what we had. It was about five or six people that used to do these entire shows. So that particular show, I remember, in Portland, uh, we had John Dusler in Philadelphia calling the show. We had Pat Brogdon in Houston, Texas, on the TriCaster switching the show. Mm. And we've got Terry Roddy and Dustin Roddy on two different cameras, and then Crazy on a microphone doing a walk and talk for you know, for, for the entire tournament for five days in a row. So were you the only one doing the commentary? There wasn't another person at this particular event. Yeah. We didn't have a backhand, like a booth, like Dave Greenwell and Rebecca Duffy and I would do at okay. the USDGC. So we'd have time to set up at the farm, you know, and of course, Terry and John, John Poole, you know, giving us anything he possibly could to support the project. So, uh, but yeah, you, you do the best with what you have and that's kind of the fun, the fun of it. 
And, yeah. Uh, but I appreciate those words uh, because it means a lot. You know, a player working into a commentary, that is pretty much a dream scenario. So mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it while I, while I did that. Love to do that again. Yeah. I've always said the way that they currently have the commentary is backwards. Um, you know, I always look at golf because we're playing the same exact sport. We just throw a Frisbee into a basket. They hit a golf ball into a hole. We should be looking at what they do a lot of times to see like, Hey, can we implement this into disc golf? And the way that golf does it is the people on the ground do the commentary. They talk, they do all that. And they send it to the people in the booth who tell you the storylines and what's going on around and they piece it all together. And they're like, all right, we're going to go to hole 17 now for Tiger Woods second shot. And then it's boom, the person on the ground saying what's going on, but disc golf is backwards. You have everyone in the booth trying to do their best to be like, well, it looks like he's like going to line up a forehand here. Uh, Oh, their disc is in the air now and it lands. Oh, is that in bounds? Uh, uh, Nate Perkins. uh, Can you see that? Is that in? It's backwards. It's, it's complete. And I don't understand. Do you have any idea why it's backwards? Well, I mean, uh, backwards is, you know, to me, that's just a word, but we're, 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 we're looking at production. And by the way, I, I just, not to correct you, but I did not send an email. I believe you're thinking about Joey Bolin, who's a, a dear friend here at Kansas oh, City. Oh, send an email about you then. Um, as from what I understand. Oh, okay. I, I stand correct. Yeah, I, I was, I was sent the email from whoever he sent it to foundation to me. So I, I apologize there, but yeah, no, someone, I guess really wanted you on the show. And when I watched that video, I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. Why is he not a part of disc golf right now? Well, thanks for that. Well, I, I live, eat, and drink, and, and dream disc golf, so I think that counts a little bit. Well, I'm saying more on the Pro Tour side. Like, what happened? Like, how did you go from commentating a world championship to 2015 and, you know, not having uh, – I, I when I watched that, I was like, I want to hear more of this. Why am I not hearing more of this? Yeah, I, I appreciate those words, Brody. I, I really do. Let me tell you a quick scenario that occurred so that it it didn't – allow disc golf planet tv to continue it's a bit of a bittersweet story i'll, I'll shorten it up for you but uh dr john J- Dusler jr who's the the masthead the executive producer executive director of disc golf planet tv uh, developed the product so that we could send these events live you know we're live streaming it's, mm-hmm. it's not broadcasting it's casting broadly but what the original concept was is the players and people that fans that can't be there, you know, we've got to feed them. We need to get them something because disc golf is so bubbling hot and it has been for a while, but the, the mountain to climb was to how do we get these images and sounds and sights and emotions to the people that couldn't join. So in a matter of days, maybe within two weeks time, John Dusler, Dr. John, who works also with CBS Sports, CBS Golf, uh, through the connections with Terry Roddy. And they have developed a rapport with all of these um, networks and with Broadcast Sports uh, Incorporated. I believe it's BSI. Uh, They developed a relationship so that the secret... The secret weapon was being developed at this time at Disc Golf Planet, where John and Terry had we picked up a an incredible genius uh, production assistant named Richard Dobson, Richie Dobson. He came on board and he committed himself to learning and designing and building and operating and training on drones on a UAV. So mm. Richie's just amazing. He went in and got his federal pilot's license. So in a matter of a year's time. After Richard Richie had been studying, John and Terry had been planning, networking, Richie got his pilot license. He'd been practicing fly piloting all along. And they were able to swing a deal with these companies so that Disc Golf Planet TV, in the matter of about two weeks' time, became the number one UAV or drone camera supplier to CBS Sports and to the PGA. Wow. So we literally had to, you know, pack up and leave. You know, I wasn't part of that particular uh, product. So, you know, I basically spent some time in the dust there. But I'm just so excited to see, you know, uh, Dr. John and Terry and Richard 
Richie, go ahead, forward, and really kick some ass. And they, they have become the premier uh, supplier for UAV sports footage. I mean, these guys are doing the Masters. They're the first to do two live broadcasts. They took two drones at a time, this last Masters, I believe it was. But they're the first to fly over NCAA football stadiums in uh, Georgia, first to fly over NFL, doing these stadium tours. So they really came up with an incredible product and, uh, you know, went from from one exciting project right into the next. So, Mm. you know, kudos and, you know, uh, to those uh, that spend the most toil come the biggest success. And that's what I hope for them. So when you're watching golf and you're watching pro sports, sometimes you never know. That's probably going to be Kaze Aerials. That's cool. uh, I didn't know that. Something that disc golf gave to the world as far as professional sports go. And they are awesome. That is, that is a cool, I, I never knew that. I, I mean, I had heard about that company being like one of the first to kind of do the live broadcasting back for disc golf, but that's kind of crazy that they went on and to, to, to do some big things in the sports world. And they still are. I mean, yeah. Dr. Dr. John's on the road all the time. Rich Dobson, uh, you know, he has, you know, found his own niche in another realm of UAV. Mm-hmm piloting so and terry roddy of course he's still partners and and i'll tell you what they're putting out a great product that'd be nice if they could come do some disc golf <laughs> they could get a freebie yeah well me and you me and yuli were talking about this at the tour championship we saw a uh you know just based off the to- topography of the course they were able to have like a camera maybe 50 70 feet behind the tee but up high and it was the best shot of disc golf all year. And I was like, that is, that's what we need to try to be doing on these shots is like way behind the player and high. Cause then you don't have to zoom or you don't have to like zoom out or cut to another camera angle. And we can see the whole flight of the disc the whole time. And it's just a great, great view. That's um, a great dynamic. You're right. Yeah. It's, hard to find. it's hard to block. It's hard to set up. It's hard to fund. hundred uh, percent. I do remember in 2014 or 15 disc golf planet TV, uh, we were able to become the first to broad to to take a live take from a live drone shot. So that was at USDGC, super fun. You know mm. that the lake there in Winthrop Farm. It's just uh, yeah, it, it's a, a dessert tray of of uh, camera angles out there. So yeah, a lot of times they use the the drone. In my opinion, they use the drone way too high, and it's like a straight down shot. And to me, like watching a Frisbee fly from that angle is not very interesting. I, I want to see it turn left and right. I want to see it go, you know, change in elevation. And when it's like that top to down, bo- I, I just lose it a little bit. And I get it. They, they don't want the drone too close because of the noise. Um, but I don't know. I, I think the drone does a good job of like showcasing maybe like the, the lay of the land, the hole. I just don't think the way that they're currently using it, it's that great for actual shots. Well, you're right about the, that those side angles are delicious, especially if you've got a longer throw than, than, than most. So mm-hmm. they really do show a lot more of the dynamic and not much, not as much the player, but the flight of the disc. I mean, everybody says, that's why I play because yeah. of the flight of the disc. Well, you know, it's also entertaining to watch. You can learn a little bit from that, but uh, it's more about production values. Yeah. And you know, to your point, you know, more is good. Yeah. So are you wanting to be involved in the production side of the disc golf pro tour and the disc golf network? Is that something that you would, if you got a call tomorrow, would that be something that you would, you know, entertain for next season? Oh yeah. I love that stuff. I still, I still feel like I have my best work ahead of me. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not the boss and, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people know crazy John because of the shift. We've had this newest, uh, two generations, I think, where since I haven't been playing as much, uh, and, and out there visibility wise as much, you can, you can kind of get passed by, so to speak. I don't think it's anybody's fault. I got a face for radio. That might be the big problem. Though. <laughs> well, but, I mean, uh, yeah, I would do that in a heartbeat. I love the, I love the action and I love telling stories about disc golf and the, the tournament towns, the, the behind the scenes stories. Yeah. There's a lot of history to be un, unveiled here. And still the players, I think they deserve to hear a lot more of the stories that kind of help build the castle, not just who's at the top, yes. but how we got there. And, and there's a lot of great, a lot of great stories to share.
Can't hear you, Yuli. That's Well, that's it for tonight. We're done. Can you get <laughs> crazy? Can you give us a little background of like um, when you started playing and the success you had as a player? And then when did that shift over to uh, the production side and commentary on course commentary and then to where you are today, I guess. There's a big gap in the middle, you know, freestyle kind of meandered in and out of that whole thing. But um, thanks, Paul. It's good to see you. You too, um, man. By the way, I'm proud of you too, carrying on the way you do. It's great to, to help the players get a little little bit of a, a breath, you know, some fresh air um, in between events. And this is a great way for, for people to, uh, to vent and explore and, like you say, uh, turn your curiosities mm -hmm. up. Um, but, uh, you, you know, for me, I, I got the bug, I got the Frisbee bug in, in college. I went to Ole Miss. I was a trombone major. And then I, I got hooked. I dumped second semester classes, kept all my music classes, left for Kansas city, and then was playing trombone at night. So I could play Frisbee all day. Um, thanks to like people like Stork and Jim Kenner and, um, Al Kurz, um, uh, freestyle took a front seat. So I still had that overall mentality uh, and I still appreciate that. You know, back, th back then we had seven, eight different events that we'd play at these larger tournaments. So it was pretty fun. Disc golf was more of the, it was more of the vacation for me because I was so focused on freestyle and maybe distance. Uh, but it took a while to get very, get very, uh, uh proficient at, at golf, honestly, like I wanted to do. But um, in a, in a, in a, there's really no connection. There is no straight line in my Frisbee career at all. So most of my um, recognition came from freestyle. And that, that comes with a lot of appearances and what have you, and all the hoopla. So um, when disc golf started becoming, you know, my mainstay, um, gosh, you know, Bud Light helped that quite a bit wow. ran the light team for nine or 10 years, eight or nine years. Actually. Why do you think companies like that were more involved? Cause I've heard about this, you know, other company, big companies like that sponsoring tournaments. Why do, why do you feel like that was happening, you know, years ago and not really happening now? Well, I mean, we had a solid product we could go anywhere, anytime, right now, anywhere, get that Frisbee flying, you know, we would be right there at, the front edge of whatever Anheuser Bush wanted us to do, be it, you know, rock concerts or touring with Stevie Ray Vaughan, or we're playing LSU Tiger Stadium, or we're doing the Kingdom, or it doesn't, it, there was no limit. So you're talking uh, freestyle. Yeah, it is freestyle yeah. here with, Bud with Budweiser. Yeah. With okay. Champion Bud Light Frisbee team. Yeah. Oh, Bud Light. Okay. So, you know, we were able to take the Frisbee front row and that that's marketable. That's mm. something that, you know, those kind of impressions are hard to find with disc golf. You have to bring a ton of people to you yeah. to get disc golf, those kind of numbers and viewership. And whereas uh, my goal was to take Frisbee where it hasn't been before and where it should be and where it can go, where it has the most potential to blow the most minds. You know, that was the whole mentality behind that. And it's a promotion. Let's face it. Trying to get people excited, have a beer and, you know, maybe gain a little bit of loyalty in the end run. That, that's all it was. So uh, these people that I might mention this evening, you know, I, I'm a byproduct. I think um, I, I'm the luckiest person that I know, but uh, it's because of the, 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 the help and the love and the guidance and the, mentoring from a lot of really amazing people. So I feel I'm still a kind of a byproduct of, of y'all, of anybody that loves Frisbee, you know, you're my friend. That's something that uh, Dr. Jim Mason used to say, Ace Mason, hmm. you know, uh, if you play Frisbee, you're my friend. So this all comes from, from deep seated passion. Honestly, I know you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you don't want to quit anything that you care about. Yep. Uh, but going back to your question, Paul, uh, moving in and out of freestyle and that was paying the bills and you don't stop that train. Well, once the Bud Light team took a bit of a, a hiatus um, after my coordinator changed in 89 and I chose to not renew my contract and specialize in, in, in golf and stick with disc golf. So in 1987, 
I was lucky enough to win the Japan Open, the first Japan Open, the, the Lark Japan Cup. So that just created a volcano for me. And I went back and started working full time. You know, I'd stay in Japan one month, two months, five months, six months. And we just do shows and tournaments and clinics and promotions. And I mean, every day, all day, all by ground miles and driving you know, and that that'll really strengthen the heart muscles, you know, when you do that. And um, uh, I'm so thankful for Japan, too. They've done so much for me. And, uh, you know, I, I really consider myself part of the Japanese family there. Some of my best friends are there. And, uh, you know, when Japan started to started to. I would say not really fade, but, you know, the priorities changed. The tournament, the Japan Open, just grew so fast after so much planning. This is so difficult to put on a major event in Japan. You've got 20 steps on that ladder. We're here in the States. You just need to know somebody with some cash and somebody that owns uh, uh, you know, a, a business, and you can put on an event. In the Japan, things are much more, um, you know, I would call it conventional and uh, uh methodical and there's a lot of protocol and a lot of tradition that needs to be maintained and upheld in Japan. And that's why the events there are so special, memorable and, uh, and, and entailed. So I think it's just uh, Japan's way of wanting to do the very best at whatever it may be. And in this case was pr producing a large major disc golf tournament. So my, my, my tenants there, kept growing and growing and growing and then we got to a good spot and then I, I, I my knees are what held me back so I, I didn't really get I didn't worry really make wake my way into disc golf planet TV and the live commentary I kind of ended up there because I couldn't walk the course mm. so I, I think my last event on those on the old knees was the uh, was the uh, Fountain Hills thrills at uh in arizona so i did go out you know on that long run like a 12-year hiatus i took but I, I did go out with a win and that kept the heart warm so i just i got my knees replaced uh, a while back and but the plant I, won the japan open last year as a matter of fact okay what about uh any the deep any I deep runs at the world championship R real quick Polly, just to get to that introduction to dr john deusler yeah. about the commentary i just happened to be there one day i went to see my crew after working um, in los angeles some of the crew lived in phoenix so i went out there it's the same weekend as the memorial and deusler had everything set up and i and he said hey why don't you grab a mic and let's see what you got <laughs> so it was that i did some interviews and then he asked me back the next year uh, wow. so terry miller was there in the beginning with dave greenwell and yep. then I believe it was Terry Miller moved on to uh, Smashbox, and then Dave and I stayed in the booth there for Disc Golf Planet. Wow. Thanks, Paul. Your question was, you said something about the World Championships. Yeah, you. I, I distinctly remember seeing you in the World Championships. You've made a couple deep runs. Um, second place, am I right? I think there are couple of seconds or else because um, you're being awfully modest about your disc golf career <laughs> being like yeah you know i won the japan open once and i'm like i'm pretty sure twice. this guy was like twice <laughs> yeah uh i'm pretty sure you years apart whoa oh wow yeah i was pretty sure that you like we're challenging Climo at a few tournaments. You know, that's like the Kansas City wide open, KCWO. We used to call that yeah. the Candy Climo wide open. So <laughs> I, came, I came from that school. You know, I, I got a lot of dust. I still have dust in my armpits from following Kenny, you know. So, you know, um, a lot of a lot of my success was powered by the players that I wanted to achieve next to and to emulate. So Kenny is still he's still my favorite. Uh, I think him and Sam Ferens and uh, uh, Jerry Garrett. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've again I've been lucky enough to make friends with a lot of people and, and take a little bit of of each with me. But uh, and the world starting on. You know, Kenny's first win was in. 1990 at uh, Phoenix, and the final course was Vista del Camino. That was, uh, I think, 
I was just a couple behind him to start that final. So we had traded off the lead, I think, six times. If you go back and look at that, we traded off. We used to play uh, – Used to play uh, eight rounds, a cut, and then a semi, and then a final. So ten Jeez. rounds in five days. And uh, but Kenny and I had a lot of fun. I, I, you know, hats off to him for for you know that's not an easy job to be Kenny. So <laughs> saying he is the real deal. Uh, so you know, he was part of my rocket fuel. And uh, but yeah, we did well. I think I I think I came out with. I made the final six of my eight years playing in the world championship. There you go. Wow. There he is. See, this guy's the real deal. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Um, wh- but where- I went from second to fourth in that final in uh, Arizona. By the okay. Way. Where do you, how do you feel about the landscape of disc golf currently? Like the pro tour, we're talking mostly just the pro tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know DGN with the subscription model, the majors. How, how do you feel about all that now? Are you happy to see where it's gone? Do you think there needs to be a lot of improvement? Do you think disc golf's growing too quickly? I think there's some growing pangs that we can sense, you know, vicariously through the players, and it's a lot of pressure. You know, you're going to live your life in the in the line in the spotlight, like like you both have. You know, Brody, you've spent a lot of time in and in, in solo frame, you know, doing things, entertaining and and living and um, you know and thriving. And you know, Paul, you've done the same. You've done a whole lot more than make putts with your disc golf career too. So that's something to be really proud of. I think if, and this is just me, but I am more concerned for the players for their mental welfare right now. So they don't have too much too quick, you know, getting a bunch of money and not knowing what to do with it. Having some advisors come on, de- on, on, online for you. And, you know, I, I hope the PDGA is staying aware of, you know, keeping um, keeping things uh, fair and square, which, which I'm sure they do. But I, I'm more speaking as a player advocate because mm. it's a lot. You know, you only you already have the travel. You already have the, the cost of play. Remember, you still got to pay to play. Yeah. So and it's not cheap. And um, I, th- I think that I. I, I love all these images that make disc golf look so incredible. So that's kudos to the disc golf network, you know, for bringing these incredible pictures and uh, uh, excuse me, pictures and, and the courses and they can take you up close. Pet cricket. Yeah. It's, uh, we have crickets here in the house. <laughs> I thought I paid that guy. It is the bug man. It's the bug man. He's at the front. I'm sorry, bud. I can't stop it. Uh, the uh, with the players being my concern, um, I, I think it's great that their intellectual properties are growing real fast, and you know you do have success on one hand. On the other hand, is when you make an extreme effort to do something like tour, be a tour player. That's a huge commitment. Like in the old days, you know we we put people in the car until we couldn't get any more people in the car and what fit in the trunk is what we're going to bring with you. And nobody knows who's going to win. We're all acting like, you know, it's a for sure win for everybody. But again, this is passion driven. So if the passion stays there and it's well seated, like within the pro tour, within the disc golf network, if passion is there, then the the finished product will be, it'll be worth the, the, the effort. It'll be worth our time to wait and watch. Um, as far as the, the landscape, you know, where do we go from here? It's going really fast. It's going up really fast. It's growing. Find a belt with enough loops on it. Um, you wonder where we go from here and what's going to be um, what's going to be fun for everybody in, in five years. So uh, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of work to uh, to try and plan ahead for this. But when you're asking this question, what do you think about disc golf, how it's doing right now? You're talking to a person who was who fell in love with this stuff, you know, 45 years ago. So I'm really happy. I'm happy for the, the folks that came before me, you know, the forefathers and, and, and foremothers, I guess is that what we call it, you know, all those involved with, with building Frisbee sports, building disc golf to where it is right now. I hope that 
they can enjoy some of the fun. Uh, but I think I think you know the best is still yet to come. So we're we're having a heck of a time watching disc golf show off, and that's what I'm happy for. It's got to be fun for the crew too. You know, disc golf network. You got a lot of people. I'm Long like, hours. Yeah. I heard. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And um, I do like this one thing. Just uh, off the cuff, though. Uh, you know, in the old days, some of these tournaments, you couldn't find a restroom anywhere. But now they got them everywhere. <laughs> we got them, two of them at hole 11. We got the trailer on 12. You can take a shower. <laughs> you know, accommodations. Also, some of the, the growth is allowing some more fun. And, and uh, the, you know, some accommodations. Uh, that make that means a lot to the players. I'm sure it does. So I'm just, I'm nothing but excited. Um, yeah, I think we're in the the era too, where like the niche community sport, where like everyone knows everyone, everyone's friends, everyone, you know, you know. Obviously, I think there's a lot of BS whenever it's like, I, I hope you do well, I hope you do well. But that small knit community, like I don't, th- we're we're kind of busting out of that, right? And you look at any production, you know, whether it's the NFL, what, whether it's the PGA tour, whether it's the NBA, any of these big sports that have multi-billion dollar companies covering them, the fans always find something that they don't like. Right. And you're going to get that with disc golf. And that's, what's kind of happening right now is like the disc golf network is getting pushback on we don't like this we don't like this commentator we don't like this the way you guys film and also now it's starting to happen with the players which i think is more on the newer side for a lot of these players because again back in the day you really only had the people paying attention to you was really a a much smaller audience that were that were more connected to you right where now you have someone that might have might might has n- never have meeting you before in person and has only watched you and you did one thing on the course that really ticked them off and now you're the worst and you're the scum of the earth and they're rooting against you and that's t- difficult for some players to take and i think it's just that bubble that we're kind of bursting out to where like this is just what sports are some people are going to be the favorites and some people are going to love and cheer and root for you. And there's going to be people that rub you the wrong way. And people are going to not want to, you know, hope you do what bad. And, uh, I don't know. I think there's some people I get the feeling some of the older players that have been around disc golf for a while, they don't like that. And I just feel like that is just what comes with get something becoming more popular. Like when it's just like, a. I'm sure you have like a, a a niche band that you really liked. That was a small band that only a couple people knew about and everyone thought they were great. And then all of a sudden, once they get on the radio or they get a little bit bigger, now people are like, this sucks. What is this? And you're like, wait, what? It's the same thing in everything. The bigger you get, the more haters are going to come in. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, are you okay with that? Are, are you fine with that happening if disc golf continues to grow and more people are out there exposed to it? That's growth. That's maturing. That is breaking the mold. So we, we don't know how it's going to be because this is still the only time we've done this. You know, we haven't gone up and then down and up again. We're only on this climb. So disc golf and flying disc sports and frisbee sports have, have maybe hit a flat spot once in a while. Yeah. I have not really seen any decline other than two things. Freestyle, yeah. which I just is amazing. And there's still a small group of people, you know, less than 100 people that do it at the level I'm speaking of. And then the overall tournaments. I still thought those are the greatest events and the way to get the huge masses of players together. It it really is still, um, you know, I'd love to put on one of those. But, you know, the Brody, the social platforms now, they're so active and they need to be fed with content, you know, content rules. So I think it's, it's a delicate balance, you know, what is growth and what is just, haters because the haters that's all they know how to do really and sometimes they, they, you know they might cloak themselves during the day but boy when they get home they can take that off yeah. and go in on the keypad and just bring it <laughs> on people and you know we can't really defend against that we can only give it the best that we have and you know if you're thinking with your heart 
and the right part of your brain, you're going to bring good no matter what direction you're looking towards. So disc golf, I think, has so many things going for it and uh, some great people. So I'm still in awe of the players and the results that they're getting and the physical commitments that they're making. There's, there, I know it's just a small group, small percentage of the overall population of professionals that are getting these awesome results and rewards. But I hope that number grows. Yeah. And I'm so thankful to see, you know, like equal pay. I love that. I'm a big, big uh, fan of Billie Jean King's, uh, you know, mantra of equal pay. And, and it works. And that belongs in pro sports. So I'm proud of disc golf. I'm proud of disc golf pro tour and bringing that forward. And, uh, and if the PDJ had part of something to do with that, you know, kudos to them. That's a great thing. You know, I think we can't really be too picky because we're, we're looking pretty good right now. I, I, I would like to, I feel like there could be some more outside the niche sponsors, hmm. some more corporate entities that might want to join on, but until we get that final product, that goes on air in a certain level of perfection. I don't know. I think we'll have to wait a little bit longer for that, but that's something that I personally care about is, is bringing some of that out of market dollar towards pro disc golf. And, um, and, and that, that's, that's a production value that, that hopefully will get addressed too. Cause it's there, you know, you gotta have a salesman. Yeah. Um, but it's what you're selling is the most important part of the conversation. Where do you stand on the, uh, the PDGA? Well, I'm, I'm one that has, I've experienced a bunch of, um, support and, um, uh, you know, understanding. And, you know, I worked with them for a long time with their events crew and Brian Graham was very, very helpful in me and, and my career too. Um, and um, so the PDJ has a tough job. That's a big ship, you know, and you can't turn a big ship too fast either way. And you got to, it's got to go from the captain down to the first mate, the XO, and then the nav person. So it's a, it's a big machine now. I, I hope that it can stay focused on the players' benefits as well as the sports outlook. And, um, and I think that the PDGA has done well to stay um, to keep their hands on the steering wheel of this thing because it can get out of it can get out of hand. Do you, you know, think though there? Do, do you think that's a negative though of where they are trying to stay in power? They are trying to like keep their stamp of approval on everything. Cause I, I think that's a great analogy of like, they're trying to keep right now their hands on the steering wheel, because like you said, like a lot of stuff is happening. A lot of stuff is changing. And I, I feel like sometimes the pro tour feels handcuffed tournaments feel handcuffed. Uh, certain things just feel like we have to go through the PDGA or the PGA has to do it. And, you know, you look at the USDGC, which the PDGA has no involvement in at, at all. And I just think that tournament's run better than any tournament we play all year. Well, that's and a I, private event. That's the bonus of being a private inv event and a private intellectual property. So it's developed from the seed. And the PDJ has been morphing to sometimes, you know, even keep up with the sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think that their concerns are aimed well. And I think this is, again, this hasn't been done before. So I think that they're, they're learning on the job. And I know that they're concerned, you know, they have to be because, you know, that's, um, you know, there's a profit margin here that has to be maintained, too. You can't keep everybody happy, but you you can focus on keeping the right people happy. You know, I would I would look forward to finding out that the PDGA and Disc Golf Pro Tour had a really open, close, conversive functional, flexible relationship with each other so that they can create a win-win rather than a um, meet once a year and discuss what happened. You know, I'd like for them to be, you know, up to date and in force and in effect mm -hmm. on all projects. I mean, the PDJ is there to help us with, um, you know, accreditation and they're here with regulation, rules, rules enforcement, um, codes, 
protocols. You know, you have to have that. In a party this big, you got to have somebody that owns the house, so to speak, and then you got to have somebody that, um, you know, that that takes care of the house. So I, I don't know if anybody has one particular role, but it would be great that we could get the PDGA and Disc Golf Pro Tour to work as much as possible, hand in hand, mm-hmm. with the same goals in mind, with the players at the top of the list, and to not just get money into the players' hands, but get riches into the pages of the disc golf history book. We have to keep making history, but making good history, that's a great way to focus, you know, um, all together, you know, all for one, one for all. Yeah, no, for sure. In a perfect world. Yeah, no, ideally. It'll, it'll be interesting to kind of see how it goes because I, I have this... Yeah, I've disagreed with some of the the decisions they've made um, over the couple last years. And there's a couple things that I feel like they've dropped the ball and didn't really handle, um, didn't they handle the situation a way that you'd want the governing body of the sport to handle it. But like you said, it's growing pains. They're learning. Hopefully things get better. Um, There are just a lot of things right now that if we're looking at the pro tour as a product, which we should, I think there's a lot of things the PDJ should be doing to make the product better. And they're just not. And that's where it's like, I think if they weren't involved as much, I think the disc golf pro tour could just do it themselves and not have to hope the PDJ does it. Um, so that's where I, I think it's a little, the, the power structure. I think the power structure should be more on the disc golf pro tour. And then they just use the rules that the PDJ you know, has across their events, but the disc golf pro tour can kind of do their own thing. And I don't know, you, what do you think? Like, sometimes it just feels like that's, it just feels like there's certain things where you're just like, why is this not happening? And it's like the PDGA is kind of always the one that's getting their fingers pointed, which I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's not fair to point your fingers at them all the time, but that's what it seems like it's happening. No, I I definitely feel like they should be two separate things. I don't think they should be the same thing. I think they should be involved a little bit here and there. But when you're talking about the pro tour, the, the way I look at it is how did you do before? And you look at the national tour and the tour that they had, and it did okay, but it didn't, it didn't do as good as the pro tour is doing. So, and I think that's why they kind of went hands off and let them kind of do their own thing. But mm-hmm. I do feel like they're involved in trying to be like, nah, you can't, you can't really do this. And it's tough to like change rules and on the fly and do those things because there's a lot of hoops we got to jump through. Um, but I also know that the PDGA has been around a long time. And if you look at how big disc golf is, and like you said, they're driving the ship, it's not in a bad direction. Um, but you, you do have to be careful with, the people at the top over there and who's doing things, which I know a couple of really good people over there that are really good friends to me. And, um, I just wish that the, I guess my biggest problem is some of the rules that we have. I feel like it's time to change uh, a few things, but other than that, you like two minutes for the putt. (laughs) Um, I, I honestly think as far as the time thing goes, um, that's one of the that's one of the things that I can't stand um, about the PDGA is they send people to like the World Championships and then you're watching a guy play in the World Championships and then you call him on time. When I saw other people on the same card do the same thing and then you didn't call him just because you want to look like you're doing your job. That's that's actually to me me picking out that you're not doing your job. You're trying to look like you're doing your job. And I, and Brody said this before, like it's like they're on a vacation. Yeah. Um, And so I don't know. I I've had personal experiences where I'm like, wait, no, I need your help. Why aren't you helping me? (laughs) You know, I I need your help to fix a problem. Why isn't this, why isn't this going? So it's not necessarily the, well, it is necessarily the rules, but it's also the people that, you know, should enforce them. Like I shouldn't be as a player when I'm trying to win a world title, um, trying to be like, Hey, speed up dude like you're breaking the rules when there's three officials following trying to hold a crowd back like you know what i mean like they they should be the ones calling that and then when they do i I don't know so 
I don't like the rule anyway. I, I think you should take as much time as you want. I don't care. As long as you're keeping up with the pace of play, take, take forever. Um, I think, what do you think is, would be cooler if somebody walked up to win the world championship and went picked up his disc and tossed it in, or would you want him to sit over there and grind over it for a little bit? You know what I mean? And build up the drama and everybody's wondering, is this going in? Is this not the wind picks up? See, there's like in sports, like that's what you want. You want a little bit of uh, anticipation. When you watch golf guy hits the ball, it takes forever for it to hit the break and you don't know if it's in or not. And it could be, you know, a 12 footer and it takes a little bit to get there. So I, I think we should take as much time as we want. If you fall behind the line and it's your fault that you're falling behind the line and you're not keep, keeping up with the card in front of you, then that's when you get your warning. But time has never been a big issue with me. You know, that, that that's a good point. That brings up the protocol of the PGA where they time the group, not the player. So, you know, when they get the chance to give a time warning, they give it to the entire group. So the group is paying the price and penance for one player potentially. But, um, but I, I think that these are things that are going to end up morphing over the years, hopefully yeah. sooner than later. I know what you mean, though. It gets a little weird when you're you're sensing that someone is afraid to call a ruling on somebody, and I I didn't I wasn't able to understand that sometimes. Until was that happening back back in your day when you were playing? Were yeah, yeah. I mean, there were some rivalries where you could almost expect something a call to coming. Happen. Yeah, but otherwise, um, you know, it's kind of icky. I mean, it's like that fine line frisbee and rules. And then it's kind, of, it's kind of like, what? Wait a minute, I'm throwing it. But uh, when you start bringing the, the rule book into play, you know, I think it puts a bigger value on how much time a player is, that I would suggest that you spend with the rule book, being familiar. I know we have to certify, um, you know, in a cycle, in a multi-annual cycle. But we also have to maybe open it up in between those three year testing periods. And I think that's something that the PGA model does well with is to keep everybody versed. And it's part of your training and part of your management, which is to go in and be remain familiar because you're not just there to police yourself. You're help there. You're, you're there to uphold the integrity of the sport. And that's why the rules were developed, which is to help keep things in the corral and not just let it get waylaid, you know, where it can definitely maybe place an advantage on one player or, or another specifically. But rules seem to help things get evened out also. So uh, maybe more to allow less advantage for one, maybe provide more advantage for all or a singular advantage to all. You know, it, it sounds deep, but there is a science to the rules. And, you know, they're not that difficult to understand, you know, harder to follow than they are to understand, honestly. So, yeah. you know, that's your, your personal integrity as a professional is to maintain a high understanding of the rules and a high level of respect for the players that follow those rules. And that can go far and wide. You know, a lot of players like Kenny uh, and, you know, a handful of others that I know are just really respectful to the rules because of their background. You know, Kenny's an amazing ball golf player. And that's where I'm sure a lot of his passion and drive and, and um, knowledge has come from by you know, growing up with the game. A lot of players have grown up with disc golf as their activity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, these last, say, 20 years, disc golf has been a lot more prevalent than before used to be saying disc golf. You almost had to say, you know, Frisbee golf. Yeah. Well, they would catch, but, you know, thank goodness disc golf has caught and, you know, and it has a good, it has a good following. Isn't that crazy now? You can say disc golf now at the grocery store or the pharmacy or the car wash and they know exactly what you're talking about. And that just makes my heart beat, you know, loud. Because yeah, in the old days we used to, it, we'd explain the whole thing every time. You could do it five times a day, you know. Frisbee. frisbee dog was the most popular frisbee thing dog. in the world yeah that's you know everyone's yeah. like where are your where are your dogs we're like no no we play ultimate frisbee like we we throw we play frisbee we play football but with a frisbee they're like yeah i have no idea what that is you're like all right yeah. well okay well yeah i was i was asked if, uh are you a professional juggler Ooh. like no <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> 
Oh, my friend Greg Osfeld. He wrote yeah. a song about it. Want to hear it? Yeah. Well, um, uh, we've got room to grow, but it, it is a good time to, you know, be thankful for what we have here. I am so thankful that, you know, more and more players are able to take on disc golf as their focus and, and actually, you know, commit to it. You know, practice, training, conditioning, health. Uh, mental awareness and, you know, positive thinking. And, and yeah, you, you can take that to the bank now. Were, so I'm happy that the horizon is far and wide. Were you ever worried, like, um, after you toured for however long you did, and then you see a young kid, um, and he's like, yeah, I want to make this my life. Were you ever like, I wouldn't do it? Like, it's a <laughs> tough life, you know what I mean? Because, like you said, you, you're all piling in the car even my early days of of traveling they it was not glamorous and before that you know one of my mentors was dan ginley and he would always tell me about the good old days and how hard it was and everything um or were you always like no have have a blast go do it yeah paul i mean i'm still in love with frisbee and disc golf and flying disc and all that stuff it changed my life man i've had 10 lifetimes of happiness just because of frisbee so it seems to keep on you know patting me on the back and hugging me and, and it's something that really it's unlike other sports you know conventional sports are really tough they're difficult and i, and I feel for kids young age kids they're going into conventional sports so much rigidity and sharp corners and demands and costs. It's so expensive for a parent or parents, uh, you know, to bring kids up through conventional sports where this is something that disc golf has a, a really nice attractiveness to it. And I would say that if I could guarantee someone could have the fun and the fellowship you know, that I had that a lot of people have had getting into it and can find a good, a good spot to hover in there. then that's, that's great. But if, it, if it's not your game, it's okay to, to put it down, but it, um, I would love for everybody to give it a shot. Yeah. Um, but, you, but you're right. It's, it's not for everybody. If that's a great thing about this golf network, for instance, is that if you're not a player, you can still enjoy the aesthetics and the visuals and the energy and excitement of disc golf. Yeah. Um, you know, we're getting closer and closer to this, you know, product where it, 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 it will catch soon. You know, everything um, that was created with love will continue to do that. If it's given that that's what it needs to survive is more love. So we got to keep the faith and, you know, uh, count our blessings and be thankful. You know, we have what we have and keep, keep working hard, keep protecting our sport. You know, we want to promote it as if it's our very own because we're still a small group comparatively. Yeah. Small group are doing a whole lot for a lot of people. So kudos, you know who you are out there too. And you guys are helping that same energy. You know, you're providing time for people to observe and, and, um, you know, take in, um, these conversations, it all helps develop your own personal perspective. Yeah, we're trying. The, the main thing about this show was to kind of, you know, obviously when me and Yuli are touring and playing the events is to give a little bit more color of what the event is, what to expect, um, leading in to hopefully have a more enjoyable experience watching. Uh, but then also to give a little bit more behind the scenes of what is actually going on in tournaments after the fact, and then also give a platform for players to express themselves because right now the only real media, you know, there's obviously other podcasts too, but the only real media that you get during the week is if you're one of the handful of people selected for the interviews that they do, like the little Q and a that they do, but they pretty much ask the same question every week. They're getting a little bit better now where clips and stuff are coming out of it, but mm -hmm. this is more long form where people can actually have time to, you know, let, let people know who their personality is and it could be good. It could be bad, right? If you come on this podcast and you kind of suck and <laughs> you say stuff that doesn't really resonate with people that actually might not really help you. But, um, if you come on and, and show a little bit more than maybe you normally do, like Calvin's a perfect example. Calvin's one of, uh, our listeners, favorite viewers, but you don't really get to see that much of his personality when he plays. You know, but when he comes on here, he kind of lets down, you know, jokes around a little bit with us. And, you know, he does that in other YouTube videos and social media as well. But 
Um, yeah, I think it's just one of those things that comes with the territory. The more media that starts building around disc golf, uh, the better. But again, at the end of the day, there's only so many people that are willing to do like passion projects, right? And so for something to really get bigger and grow, money has to be flowing in. And what you were saying is exactly right. Right now with disc golf, for almost the entire however many I've been in it, the money is just constantly circling around. So it's going from disc golf companies to disc golf fans, back to disc golf companies to disc golf fans. And we have no outside coming in. And you really need the outside money, the outside fans, the outside pe- You need that coming in for it to actually grow versus we're just kind of passing money around to one another in this small little bubble. It is. That's like, it's well put. You know, so, the, the money that we're talking about, let's just, let's kind of set up a scenario where Disc Golf Network could develop a team, for instance, just for content, uh, off course content. Uh, you know, this is a regular practice on a lot of different projects, but I mean, these guys have got so much going on. Like I said, it takes a village, but I would love for them to find the time and the wherewithal to enjoy bringing on some producers that can bring this content forward. And I know I'm not, I'm not the boss, you know, I'm just bossy, but I care. I want the best possible yeah. for disc golf. Um, you know, I have put quite a bit of work into at least trying to explain this, you know, um, on the air, like back in disc golf planet TV days, you know, cause I'm, I'm fairly frank with people and, and I want people to, to, to know that, you know, this is just me. This is just my humble opinion and my take on things. Um, uh, being in that position is a real honor and it comes with quite a bit of um, expectation. So I, I can only hope that what we did before went, uh, went in good directions and left people with a good uh, idea, left them with a good impression. And then, um, you know, Disc Golf Network too is going to keep growing. They're going to keep acquiring more assets in both human and technical assets and they're going to make sense out of it. And it's only going to get better. That is my, that's my take on that. I mean, they've got too many good things going for them. And, and I want them to, to endure a huge success because that means disc golf is going to win also. And the pro tour, like you said, Brody, that's another thing. It's a massive machine. There's so many moving parts. And you mm-hmm. got to remember, it takes a human to move these parts. There's nothing that the computer does other than what the human tells it to do. Okay. So don't forget. And it, it's, um, it's a remarkable effort. And I'm so happy that disc golf has, has a group and groups that care about it enough to, to invest and commit to it like that. It's getting me excited now. I kind of want to, I kind of want to go get me a fake earbud. <laughs> Well, that's what, I mean, we're the, we're in the off season here, right? We've got yeah. November, December, January, and then most of February. And then we're back at it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Yuli, we, we've got a few connections. I, I, I would love to see you at least like go out on a couple events and just yeah. see, you know, I mean, yeah. what's, what's the harm in that? Well, I got a suitcase here. I'm going to show you, I'm bringing my portable, but I can check <laughs> in here. No, I, 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 it sounds great to me, but again, I'm not the boss, you know, I'm just bossy. I care. Um, I care for y'all. Yeah. So no, I, it, it, I, I, I would love to just see an event switched where they have someone on the ground doing the majority of the commentary, co- the color and, and what's actually happening. And the people in the booth is setting the stage, letting you know what par the hole is, letting you know how under, uh, you know, where he is on the leaderboard, all that stuff. I would love to see it. I would love to see it just once to give, you know, the viewers a chance to look at and be like, huh, this, this might actually be a better product than what we previously were doing. I, that's just one thing I don't think we do enough right now is we don't do it enough experimenting. Or maybe it, just bombs, but at least, you know, you yeah. got to experiment to know. Yeah. Sure. That's what I'm saying. Sure. You got to, you got to try stuff out. Exactly. Right. So, yeah. So pro yeah. tour. Yeah. I know there's somebody, someone's listening, someone's listening, put this man on the course, 
Give them three holes. Give them a three hole tryout. Happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I was thinking, uh, that reminds me, I was thinking up this thing where, let's see. Oh, I was watching the ladies in Europe last fall. And they, um, there's a nice, healthy gather, gallery. There's a couple spotters. They were following the players, and I was imagining the cameras. And I was thinking about if they had somebody on the ground. You could have, hey, we spotted, we have a celebrity spotter. And it's not somebody that looks for famous people in the audience. It's a famous person spotting. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, well, maybe, really well, yeah, you know what? Maybe you're not meant for the, for the job. You <laughs> 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 take back. back his vote I'm of approval. Gonna I'm just going to rake the bunker on seven. I'll be back. For yeah. <laughs> no, how, how, my playbook has always been, I'm going to throw 10 things out there. And if one of them hits, yeah. Well, hey, let's just run with that. But if if you're if you're scared to fail, that's that's the real uh, you know that's the real disaster to growth. Like that's the the real enemy to growth is being scared to fail and playing it safe. And I think I think right now we've hit a plateau. Like disc golf has definitely hit a plateau, um, and it's like to get that next. Thing. We got it. We got to start trying to take some risk here and see what happens. What's what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, that's right. And we'll all, see. That is, all that goes towards, you know, a wonderful finished product. Yeah. So blow the dust off of anything that comes that way. And that's a good way to look at it. He has a well, lot of, a lot of people uh, are that are watching right now. Hopefully will, you know, maybe send a comment your way where they might have a suggestion. You know, you could be a, speaking uh, a sounding board you know for suggestions like that i know disc golf pro tour and disc golf network i know that they have communication channels open sure but not everybody's excited to kind of share their idea that way so yeah. um you know so I, I like your i like your description of that no we definitely we definitely get a lot of feedback that is for sure but yeah hopefully <laughs> hopefully normally from some- paul needs to not not talk as much or uh <laughs> That was a or horrible take. Brody's or... too loud. Have Brody stop yelling. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. Um, Paul, say four more words. That'll be a hundred. I got to work. <laughs> uh, but hey, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day, uh, coming on here and talking. Um, okay. I hope, I hope something comes of this. I hope someone out there is watching or listening and, and maybe we get to see you on coverage next year, because I, I think, from what I saw and after talking to you, know, you know, the stories and experience that you have, I think you have a lot to offer still to the pro game. And uh, I think you would bring a lot to the table and I, I, w- I would love to see it. I would love to see what happens and how it goes. And uh, hopefully, hopefully someone is listening and uh, we see you next year. Well, oh, thanks a lot, Brody. I appreciate that. You know, it goes a long way. Of course. Appreciate that. Uh, Appreciate you guys having me on. I think we should do this again. I got some stories I'd love to share with yes. you guys. I think your viewers would get a kick out of. Yes. Next time, <laughs> next time we have you back on, we want to hear those stories. That's for sure. So the the success, you know, that I wish for you guys is on the air, and maybe we can all have something together on the course together. I'd love to do that. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Appreciate. It. I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of both of you. Don't forget. Hey, thank That's you crazy. so much, man.